Good afternoon. Many of us here have participated in an American rite of passage, a ritual that demarcates a transition in life, a movement from some other country to belonging to the United States of America. How many of you have been in a ceremony like that? And how many would like to be? <laughs> uh, Others of, others of us were born as citizens and didn't get the chance to go through a ceremony like that. Our rite of passage was a little different. Maybe it was registering for the right to vote, uh, exercising some other privilege of citizenship. My purpose today is not to comment on U.S. citizenship, but since the government shut down, uh, but on a different citizenship. Uh, <laughs> And as you might guess from my title, the ceremony involves water. And we call it baptism. And I'd like to compare the meaning of baptism with a citizenship ceremony. In this case, for the kingdom of God. <coughs> Many of you participated in this kind of ceremony. And remember it as a significant moment in your life. Others of us don't remember much about it, even though it pictured a defining moment. And perhaps some of you are wondering whether you should participate in such a ceremony. So hopefully what I say today will be meaningful to everyone, uh, whether you're looking backwards or looking forwards, uh, no matter whether you're thinking about the past or the future, because the meaning is the same, and, and that's the important thing about it. Now, despite what the title of my message, the purpose of the ceremony is not to get people wet. Uh, it might do that, but that's not its main purpose. If you want to get wet, there are lots of better ways to do it. Uh, but it is a byproduct uh, of the ceremony. It's not its purpose. The purpose of the water is to symbolize something else, and that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, now, to, uh, to, you know, to kind of start the discussion, I, I have a pot of water here, and I'm going to dip something into it. I wanted to bring a potato, but I forgot. So I'll, I'll <laughs> so suppose I just dip this into the water and bring it out. Now, in real life, why might I do such a thing? Yeah, clean it. Uh, it may not get very clean in one second or so, <clears throat> but that's that's about the only thing it's going to do for this. In this case, a salt shaker. <laughs> Now, we might want to you know, clean something like that. Uh, if we really wanted to clean it, we'd scrub it, rub it, you know, whatever. Uh, but in a uh, Christian baptism, uh, we don't do that. We just dip somebody in water for a moment. And it's natural for people to think that uh, we're picturing some sort of cleansing. And that's indeed something that baptism does picture. For example, we'll look at 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11. So after Paul has given a long list of different types of sinners, he says in verse 11, And such were some of you, you were sinners like that, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. For this word washed, Paul is referring to baptism. The people were sinners, but now they are washed. They had been spiritually unclean, but now they're clean. They're, now they're sanctified, suitable for use in God's work. Their status has been changed from sinner to saint. And that's what baptism pictures. We can see a similar use in 1 Peter 3, verses 20 and 21. And again, here it starts out talking about the problem of sin and how baptism pictures the removal of that problem. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 20. Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, this is in the, the days of the flood, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Verse 21. Baptism which corresponds to this now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this is talking about the big flood 
Eight people were saved from the floodwaters by being in an ark, this big boat. And in verse 21, Paul says that baptism corresponds to this. It, it's similar to this. We aren't saved by a boat. And Noah was saved by staying dry, whereas we are saved by getting wet. Uh, baptism is about invisible dirt, sin. And it's about cleansing our conscience. It's about removing guilt, something invisible. It's moving from one status, the status of being condemned, to the status of being saved. And Peter says it does this through the resurrection of Christ. He didn't really explain how that works, but we can notice at least a couple of things about it. First, it's done by Jesus. And second, it was accomplished in the past. It's a done deal. We're not saving ourselves by something that we do. What we do in baptism is just following through on something that Jesus has done for us. <clears throat> Paul mentions another Old Testament precursor of baptism in, the first, in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. He compares baptism to the Israelites' exodus from Egypt. See, he says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, verse 2, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So there's something similar, he's saying, between baptism and the escape of the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. There was a cloud over them and there was water on the right and the left. They didn't get wet, but it was sort of like a baptism, Paul was saying. As Christian baptism pictures something similar, this movement from one place to another. Noah and his family were saved in a physical sense. The Israelites were saved in a physical sense, and they didn't drown when they went through the Red Sea. Now, in baptism, we're not really worried about drowning. At least I hope we're not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, our concern is being saved in a spiritual way, of being rescued from a spiritual danger or spiritual slavery. Paul brings up this spiritual symbolism for baptism in Romans chapter 6. And again, his, his comment isn't like a textbook. He's not saying, okay, now I'm going to explain what baptism is and how it's done and, and the words we're supposed to say. Uh, no, he, he takes baptism as something that the people are already familiar with. And he's using it to answer a different question. In this case, the question is, does God's grace mean it's okay to sin? If we're going to be forgiven anyway, does it matter whether we do anything wrong? I talked about that in more detail last month, so I'll just summarize it here. No, it's not okay to sin. <laughs> sin is contrary to everything that Christ stands for, and He wants us to escape the slavery of sin. He doesn't want us to continue living in sin. So what's He saying in Romans 6? So let's look about baptism. Let's look at verses 3 and 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Baptism means that we died with Christ. We were buried with Christ. Our old self died. We now walk and live in a new way. And we're to live this new way of righteousness. So in this context and purpose of the passage, Paul is saying that the old and sinful way of living is supposed to be dead. A new and right way of living is supposed to be alive in Jesus. And he's saying that baptism corresponds to this change in the way we live. Baptism pictures our death and burial with Jesus and being raised with Him too. Being put into the water pictures being put into a grave. Coming up out of the water pictures being raised from death to a new life, a new way of life. 
And, and we can note again here that this was done by Jesus in the past. Baptism is a reminder and a picture of something that happened in the past. If we were buried with Christ, then that's something that happened in the past. It's not happening now. What we're doing now is just picturing and remembering what happened to Jesus, or what us with Jesus in the past. In some ways, it's like the annual Jewish celebration of Passover. They commemorate the exodus from Egypt, commemorate the uh, escape from slavery in Egypt with some ritual symbolism, a lamb, some unleavened bread, some bitter herbs. These things remind them of the salvation that God gave them in the past. And in a similar way, baptism reminds us of what Jesus did to save us. He died for our sins, bringing all of our sins to the grave, and he rose to bring us a new life. A life in which those sins aren't counted against us. A life in which we're not supposed to continue in sin. Well, there are a few other verses. Uh, but we already have enough to start talking about the meaning of baptism. What, what's it supposed to symbolize? And, I, and I'd like to start by looking at a kind of a mistaken way to go about it. Uh, as a foil for uh, what's right. And then we'll see a, a better focus. First way is a kind of a mistaken way. That's to focus on the Greek word baptizo. That's obviously where we get the English word baptize. So our thought is, well, we should go back and see what they what they originally mean about it. The problem is the words can kind of change meaning over time. So sometimes it's kind of misleading to focus on what it originally meant. The English the English word nice originally meant silly. It's quite, quite different now. Uh, so we have to, have to see how the words are actually used. What we see the, with the word baptizo is that it originally meant to immerse something in water, like I did that salt shaker in the, in the pot, uh, to dip it in or, or to let it soak, uh, like we might put a piece of cloth into a dye so that it comes out a new color. The Greek word was used in those senses. So some people concluded from this that a baptism should always be done by immersion. The person has to be completely under the water, even if a toe sticks out. And the baptism wasn't a real baptism. It has to be done again. And the idea is we can't picture baptism, our burial with Jesus, unless we're totally under the water. And we have to do it just right, or else it won't be effective. But the New Testament doesn't seem to be quite so worried about the original meaning of the word. The people in the ark weren't immersed. Uh, the Israelites coming out of Egypt weren't immersed, and they especially weren't immersed into Moses, <laughs> like, even though Paul says they were baptized into Moses. Uh, those are figurative uses. And it shouldn't be too surprising when symbolism uh, has figurative uses. We can see another figurative use of the word in Luke 12, in verse 50. Jesus says, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Jesus is talking about his suffering and death. It's not a baptism in water. It's a figurative sense. In Mark 10, verse 39, Jesus tells James and John that they're going to have this baptism too. They told him, uh, we're able to do this. And Jesus says, yes, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I'm baptized, you will be baptized. And sure enough, Jesus, uh, James and John both suffered and died because of their faith in Jesus. It was a figurative referral there. You know, we could read those, that, uh, those verses with the meaning of immersion. You know, I'm going to be immersed in suffering and death. It's kind of figurative even there. Uh, but Jesus isn't talking about any immersion. It's like when I go to bed at night, I'm going to be immersed in blankets. <laughs> or uh, when I walk through the garden, I'll be immersed in the fragrance of pomegranate blossoms. <laughs> no, he's not talking about any immersion. He's talking about a special kind of immersion, a special sort of experience. And the focus of his expression has shifted away from the quantity and moved toward quality, the significance of the experience. That's what's important. And that's in his expression here, that's what's important. Not the idea that it will surround him, but that it will be this dramatic, 
point in his life when everything changes. It's a decisive moment when his life changed, and as it turns out, our life did as well. More recently, I heard a different idea based on the uh, meaning of the word baptizo. Uh, and that's the idea, well, baptism means immersion. And so what might that mean spiritually? What are we immersed in spiritually? <coughs> well, we're immersed into Christ, into the family of God, into the Trinity. So therefore, <coughs> this idea is that baptism pictures being immersed into the life of God. And I agree that we have been brought into the life of God, into His family, into His kingdom. But that's not quite what baptism pictures. Because in ceremony baptism, we don't stay immersed. We, uh, it's all over in a second. In baptism, our new life is pictured by coming up out of the water, not by going into it. Going into the water pictures death and burial. Uh, being immersed in the water pictures being buried. Rising up from the water pictures a new life. See, baptism is picturing a story, a movement, a time of change, not just the final result. The result, baptism pictures a change. 1 Corinthians 6, 11, that we saw, saw earlier, says it was a warship. <coughs> this moving from a lifestyle opposed to God to one that's in harmony with Him. 1 Peter 3, we saw earlier, says it refers to a cleansed conscience. Something that used to be one way and is now another. Romans 6 says it's a movement from death to life. When Jesus referred to his suffering and his death as a baptism, it was a time of this dramatic change. Going from one status to another. Going through this life-changing transformation. Titus 3, verse 5, gives us another example of that. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. This washing of regeneration. Regeneration means to generate again, to start again. It's referring to baptism. And Paul associates it with the renewal of the Holy Spirit. It's a new start in life. The Bible calls it being born again. This verse tells us a couple of important things about salvation. First, it's not something that we can do, even by works done in righteousness. It's something done by Jesus. He's the one who saved us. And He does it by the Holy Spirit. We're saved by grace, not by works. Saved by Jesus, not by what we do. To illustrate that, I wanted to come up with a story. So, we're sitting on a park bench in Pasadena. We're just bored out of our minds. Oh, nothing to do. What's there to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? And along comes this man and a wife, and he hands us tickets to Disneyland. And he says, we're planning on going, we were planning on going to this special event in Disneyland, but something else came up. Would you like to go to Disneyland absolutely free? And we say, bummer, we don't even have money to, for the bus to Anaheim. And they say, no, don't worry about it, our limo driver will take you there for free. <laughs> and, then, and then one of our friends says, don't do it, it's a scam. <laughs> They're going to give you a free ride, all right, but it's a one-way ticket to some gravel pit in the desert. <laughs> well... <laughs> We look at the limo, we look at the tickets, we look at boredom in the park, and we say, let's go. <laughs> so we go to Disneyland and we have a great time. And then, then somebody asks us, hey, how did you guys get in here? So how are we going to answer that? Are we going to brag about how clever we were in ascertaining that the tickets were legitimate? <laughs> Or are we going to just say, some nice man and woman gave me these tickets and gave us a free ride to get here? Hope we can get home. Oh. <laughs> uh, now, in the same way, when Jesus gives us salvation, are we going to brag about how good we were to believe the offer? 
Or are we going to praise Jesus for his generosity? I think we should praise Jesus and not ourselves. Our belief really doesn't add anything to the equation. All the credit for salvation goes to Jesus. And although we do need faith to take, to take him up on his offer, our faith really didn't add anything to it. The tickets are legitimate, whether we believe it or not. We praise him for giving us the tickets and not praising ourselves for being willing to use them. So we can apply that to baptism. Is baptism a ceremony in which we announce to the world our faith in Jesus? Well, maybe it is. But that's incidental. It's a byproduct. It's not the main purpose. The main purpose is that we commemorate what Jesus has done. He gets the credit. He has transitioned us from death to life. Have you ever noticed that we don't baptize ourselves? It's done to us. Reflecting the fact that salvation is given to us. It's not based on some good thing we've done. We don't do it unless we have faith in Jesus, but it's not commemorating our faith. It's commemorating what Jesus has done for us. It's, it's a ceremony in which we acknowledge that we died with Christ. We were buried with Him. We rose to new life in Him. The most important transition in our life was accomplished by Jesus 2,000 years ago. He did it. Our part is to acknowledge it. And that's why baptism as a ceremony is done only once. If it pictured our current life in Christ, then it would seem that we could continue doing it as often as we wanted to. Uh, but it's done only once for each person. That's because it's picturing a dramatic transition in life that happens only once. It doesn't need to be repeated. Jesus has taken us from being sinners to being saints, from being condemned to being sanctified. He has done it. And our part is just catching on to what he's done. We don't need to repeat it every time we come back to the faith or every time we come to some new level of understanding. The decisive thing has already been done by Jesus. You know, he had told James and John, we saw earlier, you will be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. Yes, they died with Christ. They rose with Christ and so did we. Our baptism is not valid unless the baptism of Jesus is valid, unless his suffering and death was valid for us. Our faith can't make it so. It is so, regardless of whether or not we believe it. But when we believe it, we also acknowledge it by participating in the ceremony of baptism. Our baptism in water commemorates and signifies Jesus baptism of suffering and death and resurrection on our behalf. Well, thankfully, we don't have to be baptized in blood. The Mithras cult did that. People got into a pit underneath a bullpen and the bull's throat was cut and all the blood poured down on the person under the pit. Um, we have a much cleaner ceremony. <laughs> Even though we do have sayings, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> uh, don't take it literally. <laughs> Water will do <laughs> just, just nicely. It, it is a symbol. It's not, and it's not based on what we do, but on what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago. Uh, Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14. Paul describes what was done for us. God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He's brought us from the domain of sin and death and into the domain of righteousness and life. And that transition is pictured by the ceremony of baptism. When you were baptized, you were acknowledging that Jesus is your Savior. You were cleansed by what He did. And it's done. You can look back and say, I have been baptized. I belong to Christ. His death and resurrection saved me. I'm already in His kingdom, and that can't be taken away from me. I don't need to go through the ceremony again, because it never stopped being true for me. 
I've been baptized. I've acknowledged what he did for me. Colossians 2 adds a little more in verses 11 and 12. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. So Paul here is comparing baptism to a different initiation, right? Circumcision. We don't need that physical ritual, Paul says, because we have the reality of it in Christ. Baptism pictures us being included in a much more important transition, being buried with Jesus, being raised to life in Him. And that's something that's good for eternity. Verse 13 tells us this involved the forgiveness of sins. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him, together with Jesus, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Just as the Israelites went from slavery in Egypt by going through the Red Sea, just like the Corinthians went from being sinners to being sanctified for God in Christ, so also we have made a transition. Or, I should say, this transition has been made for us. We've been brought from darkness into light, from the kingdom of death into the kingdom of Christ because... Even though we didn't know it at the time, we died with Christ and rose with Him. And that transition is pictured by the ceremony of baptism. Now there's some here who have never been baptized, and I encourage you to be baptized. It doesn't matter if you're not good enough for it. None of us is. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're absolutely positive about the validity of it. That's okay. The ceremony isn't about the quality of our faith. It's about the quality of our Savior. It's simply acknowledging that Jesus died for your sins, that you were included in his suffering and death, and in his resurrection too. It's acknowledging that he's forgiven your sins, cleansed your guilt, brought you into the kingdom of Christ. You belong to him, whether you believe it or not. And in baptism, we are saying, Okay, I admit it. It's about him and not about me. And all of us who have been baptized can look back and be reminded of what Jesus has done for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for including us in what Christ has done. That our old self has been put to death in him. That we now live in newness of life because He has been resurrected and we are united with Him. Thank You for doing that. Thank You, Jesus, for doing that. Thank You, the Holy Spirit, that You're changing us even now, to be bringing us closer to the kind of people we would like to be. In Jesus' name, Amen.